All right, welcome to today's episode of the Australian Lawn and Garden Podcast. This is a very special episode. We have our first international guest, but not we, we didn't we didn't scrape the bottom of the barrel. We got one of the most influential people, even though he's probably too humble to admit this, but one of the most influential people in turf. He's a Premier League stadium turf manager. I don't know if that's your proper title, John, but we have John Ledwidge. He is, I mean, you look after literally some of the best turf in the world in the Premier League. I mean, I'm honored to have you on. I've been looking forward to this all week. I told all my friends, I told my mum, I told my grandma. <laughs> Seriously, yeah. <laughs> I don't think my head's going to fit in the screen in a minute if you keep going. But no, it's I just great. I can great. sleep in a little bit. I can sleep out a little bit. So yeah. it's work <laughs> you need to. But no, I, I was telling you off air um, that, uh, look, let's just put this on the screen. Let's start straight away with this. Many years ago, Brilliant. and unfortunately, you ruined it for everyone. It's, if I understand it, it was your amazing work that got this stuff banned, isn't it? Well, your team's work. You do like to credit <laughs> everyone. But I'm going to put something on the screen here. Look <laughs> at that lawn. For those who are who are just listening, which is the majority of people, this lawn here, he, this team has mowed the pattern of the Leicester City Football Club <laughs> logo in the center of a pitch. You did this, what, eight, nine years ago, something like that, uh, seven yeah. years ago. It was a long I, time still ago. Don't, I still don't know how you do it. But if, if anybody who loves lawn and loves sport, this was this went viral. This is all over the internet. This is, you know, I mean, probably still, people still talk to you about it now, right? Yeah, they do, to be fair. And, you know, like we were saying just before we started, the whole point of this, um, the patterns, as, as we've sort of become quite famous for, is, is that it's to help raise profile of the industry. Yeah, in this country, we are regarded quite highly in terms of, of our professional skill set, uh, um, football clubs and sports clubs across the country. Um, but the industry needs new people. The industry needs new uh, sort of excitement coming into it, new blood coming into it. And we were on the trajectory of winning the, the league that year. Um, yeah. as, as a lot of people know who follow the Premier League when Leicester won it that year against all the odds. And um, we took our opportunity to, to put groundsmanship front and centre of that, along with the success of the club. And, you know, this sort of, this was one of many. Um, and it, to be fair, it was, it was definitely a team effort as everything is at, at the club. Um, but it was a bit of a, no, I wouldn't say it was a pain, but it was a, it was a lot coming in those <laughs> few hours earlier because it, it's not, a, it's not a standard mo. Um, you know, with it will take us. Yeah, these things were taking an extra two or three hours. So on a match day, we were coming in at five a.m. Um, for a three o'clock kickoff just to That's get these crazy. things. Crazy. So, but but it was again, it was all for a, a bigger purpose. It, it wasn't. It certainly wasn't a sort of um, self self awareness or self something to do with me. It was. It was definitely yep. our team, definitely to raise awareness and and that one. Um, that was sort of like the the pinnacle bit, really. We had had a, a to to enlighten you into how it's done. Effectively, we had a machine come in, and you can put any sort of um, picture or image into it. So even your face, Luke, if you wanted to put your face in the middle of the fit pitch, that would be really egotistical, wouldn't it? Can you imagine? Hey, John, next yeah. game. Yeah, could you just my face it? That in? Yeah. yeah. Um, and and basically, this machine goes across. It's a little sort of you know forty two inch deck machine with compressed air units on the bottom and as right. it goes as it goes across it works a bit like a printer where you'll see there that we've pushed the grass in a single direction so you'll see as you look yes. across the pitch behind the badge it's all in one direction so basically what yep. that machine does goes across the pitch and blows the grass back the other way so then you see the pattern um and it works like a printer it just really goes up and down up and down up and down up and down and works like a printer as, as it prints out across the paper um but that was again that was an incredibly early start and lots and lots of the biggest challenge we had with that was all the tire marks because this little machine um which was on a little cub cadet sort of like zero turn type machine just yep. going across that pitch time and time again was uh the hardest bit to manage but around that the circles and the lines and the dashes and the dots and everything else that's um that's all our work but the machine did that bit in the middle but uh yeah it was incredible it was incredible well, I'm just as impressed by the circles. Right? For <laughs> those who, because, I mean, we talked about this with, with Matt in the last podcast, for those who are listening. Like, I mean, you guys get incredibly straight lines. Okay, I understand that. 
because you have a string line. At least that's what Matt was saying, and I believe yeah. that's the case for you guys. Yeah. Okay, I can understand that, right? I use cylinder mowers all the time for the work that we do, right? Walk behind ones, big heavy ones. I how do you get how do you get a circle without you know, I can't tell any wobble in that. You know, that looks yeah. just about perfect. Right? Yeah, well, like, I'm, how do you do that? I mean, obviously, normally, without the badge in the middle, we'd have the center circle as our first. It's almost like our string line. If you imagine a string line, but just in a circle. Yep. And we take it off that. And then, obviously, with the years and years of experience we've got with mowers and knowing yep. how to edge, where to push, place the edge to get the best line, um, you know, it, it's just a case of following your previous edge. So if one goes wrong, it'll all go wrong and then you have to go back to the start again but you know for me it's um it's the same as when we mow in a straight line i say to my guys you know every single line that you mow should be like a block edge it should be straight everything should be neat and tidy because the last thing you want is two straight edges which you get in the contrast of the light and dark and then in between everything's doing this and wibbly wobbly so yeah it's i think it's, it's years of practice to be honest luke it's just you know all our guys are really experienced and really sort of well-trained professionals and uh yeah but I, i'll take the compliment on the circles considering the badge looks so good <laughs> it's, it's the whole thing i've got a few more let's i'll zoom out of this so i can scroll through the next one i mean these patterns as well like <laughs> i mean you've seen this fifty thousand times haven't you every time yeah. someone talks to you they probably bring this sort of stuff up right yeah that's it that's that's done the wrap that's done the rounds that one for sure it's um Again, it, it's relatively simplistic what we're doing. It's not, um, it's not too overly complicated, but it looks really, it's really effective when we've when it's finished. Um, yeah, again, that's done with a string line. It's it's on okay. the mowing. I was going to so ask. Yeah, so the mowing blocks are already there. Instead of going sort of you know north to south and east to west, we've just gone on an angle and we've just followed it up the pitch one way and gone across the pitch the other way. So it's. Um, but again, that that take that added another sort of that, that sort of an extra hour or two onto a, a morning prep. So it's uh, yeah, it's, but well, it's a nice people, one, that one. If you guys are just listening to this, um, you could either jump on the YouTube and have a look at the video, or you could go on the Instagram because I'll put this as part of the promotional post. Just these photos. There's some more as well. There's another one with a logo that's a little bit different. Yeah, that was uh, that, that, that was the first trial of us. Um, so we had an event at the stadium and right. one, the company that were American company that were trying to promote this sort of um, doing this, yep. they do a lot of it in America. Um, right. Yeah. They wanted, they wanted it as a bit of a showcase. So this wasn't actually for a game. This was just for an event that we were holding at the stadium. Um, and it gave us an idea of what the, the machine could do and whether we'd implement it for a game. So yeah, that was the, that was the first trial, the first trial run, if you want. And then the last one that I've got, is is this one here which is very similar to the one we just showed it might even be from the same game is it or yeah. is this a slightly different pattern you did yeah it's no it's all the same and like you say you'll see um on that one where the where the sort of north to south um blocks join that's where the the crisscrosses are so you'll see that we had sort of a, yep. pin, a point to point and um and an up a singular up and a down and that's what creates those uh sort of patterns but i think when you look at it from sort of camera angle it, it almost looks 3d i think that's what most people said it looked sort of oh it like does it. yeah yeah so. uh, especially from this angle because i think the other angle it looks artistic this angle looks geometric like this angle does look like it looks like you could take a step up those diagonals you know like the <laughs> yeah, dark part yeah. is is a vertical and the, the white part or the lighter part is a flat part it's like you can literally just step up yeah. that must i mean are you the person or your team responsible for them banning these sorts of patterns or was that already going to happen and you just took advantage of it because i can see how they they for the context they for those who don't know they they said no you've got to keep it simple because the if i understand correctly the referees need help with their offside that's a hard enough job already give respect to referees let's give them some straight lines to work with yeah uh did you know that was coming or was it that you that sort of ruined it for everybody else <laughs> no well we, yeah well sort of we we didn't necessarily know it was coming but as with most big organizations like the premier league they like standardization same as yep. if you look at the women's world cup at, at, at the yep. minute and fifa stipulate a mowing pattern and all the stadiums will be uniform um so it was more a case of premier league aligning themselves with with that in terms of being a bit more like uefa a bit more like fifa in terms of what they stipulate um and they didn't take all creative license we can still go sort of as i say here north to south and east to west 
Um, and we can do that in a variety of ways, but we just we just standardized ourselves to be fair and, and sort of fell into line. It was there was a little bit of noise in a couple of the Premier League meetings that we were in that the, the officials were getting confused with some of the offsides, but I sort of challenged it when VAR come in that maybe we could bring them back, but they were having none of it because then apparently it confused the cameras. So I just uh, oh, I give, nice. up, give up at that point. But, you know, I think for what it was, you know, I wasn't the first person in the world to ever do patterns. I'm sure I, won't, I definitely won't be the last. Um, but in this instance, it absolutely served its purpose and it kept people talking about the industry, which was absolutely the number one priority. So, And it really inspired people. It inspired me, you know, I didn't even know your name at the stage but just being a a football fan and being a you know obviously a gardener and, and a lawn whatever you call it lawn mowing Technician. person <laughs> i don't know we need we need like a better name for that or maybe i just need to increase my vocabulary but the yeah as somebody who who's interested in both sides of that uh, it was a fascinating thing for me and and it really like it's one of those things where you know, like when it was it Rogers Bannister uh, who broke the four minute mile, and uh, it's like no one thought it was possible. Then he did it, and then everybody else starts doing it. And there's things like that where so, and that was what it was like for me. Like uh, I've always been interested in doing patterns, and I don't have a whole you know, yeah, <laughs> soccer pitch to do it on. But you know, doing it on my home lawn and stuff, it, it's just a curious thing. So, yeah. do you ever get? Um, uh the uh, i'm not sure what the rules are with friendlies right you do these pre-season friendlies do you ever are you allowed to go back to these fun patterns and do you ever get tempted to do it in certain games where maybe the rules aren't so tight yeah or i mean just... the um the, so obviously now unfortunately for leicester um we were relegated out of the premier league last year into the to league below and in the league below it's allowed, you know, you're, you're allowed to do them. And quite interestingly, it was when we got relegated, it was one of the first things that lots of people asked, oh, can we do the patterns again? Um, but again, it's, you know, we could is, is the short answer to it. Um, but we haven't is that because these things also, once we burn them in, if we haven't got a good enough gap sure. between matches, it's still there, it's still visible. And obviously, you know, all the managers are different as well. And some managers might just want the simplistic thing to match the training ground. So unless we were doing it at the training ground, they may not want it at the stadium. So I think um, for the sake of what it was, I think it was, uh, yeah, it was, it's sort of one of them that we can put in the archive and we'll probably stay there um, until, yeah, maybe an exhibition game or something celebrate, ce celebratory. That's not even a word. Yeah, I think it might be a word. But yeah, it, maybe that might be when we bring them out. Yeah. So. But maybe the now, ten year, cool. maybe the ten year anniversary of you winning the Premier League, <laughs> yes, something yeah. like that. Now <clears throat> we've got to talk about that because here's what here's two things. I, I've done a bit of research on you, as I do with all guests, and I did a bit of research before I asked you to come on. I, I was really quite curious, and one of the things about the Premier League, as somebody now, I don't support any teams, right? I support whoever's got an Australian in there somehow. So this year it's Tottenham because Ange Postacoglu is their yeah, coach. Of course. Um, when, um, when Leicester was playing, I would like to say that I was supporting you before the bandwagon because you had a certain man called Mark Schwarzer as your backup yes. goalkeeper. Yeah. And uh, he was one of my favorite players growing up. But – one of the things that we love about the Premier League, anyone who loves the Premier League, is that anybody can win it, technically speaking. You can go from eight tiers down in the depths of English football and somehow work your way up, theoretically speaking. And there was a certain year where a certain team that had 5,000 to 1 odds, and that was your team that almost got relegated the season before. You came within a couple of games, and it is this fairy tale story of any anybody who – who you don't even have to like football slash soccer. Obviously, this is an Australian podcast. You don't have to even like the sport to get caught up in this amazing story. And you were the groundskeeper during that whole episode. What was that like being there for one of the best sporting, you know, stories in all sport in all history? Yeah, I mean, it was it was incredible. First and foremost, it was it was I think for me it'll be a once in a lifetime scenario in terms of how it came about. But we were also here the season before when it didn't look so great. Um, but what helped us, I think, is the year that we actually survived. 
Um, we got we gained some momentum. I think it was in the last seven games where we just went unbeaten and dragged ourselves out. And then I think it gave the, the squad the belief. Listen, I'm talking from a also from a fan at that point, and I'm not talking like I, I know that I was involved in the team, but certainly you felt the belief around the place that we'd done something really special by staying up. And then when we started the, the following season and we carried on where we left off, um, despite the change in manager, um, you just got a sense of belief. And I think that I think overwhelmingly what we felt around the club, what we I, we felt from our perspective, and I certainly felt, was there was this just belief. It was one game at a time. Things were going well. Another win, another win, another win. And then all of a sudden, the wave started to really crest. And we were like, whoa, you know, this, this could actually happen. Um, and there's just such a sen sense of togetherness at the club at that point, um, and there still is now, it, but in that year, everyone just sort of thought, we might actually do this. Um, Crazy. And we were all, it's one of them scenarios in any business, in any football club, in any sporting club, when everybody's rowing in the same direction, th magical things seem to happen. Um, and all of us from, from the ground up to the, the very top of the football club just had that bit of, humble belief that maybe we could do it um and that when um hazard scored that goal against spurs which basically won us the league um you know we were all together to celebrate that at the stadium and all the staff were together like not just my staff club staff senior management um the players ha were having their own little party at uh, jamie's house yeah. and um you know, we celebrated that together and then we got locked in the stadium because within five minutes of that goal going in and the final whistle going, the stadium was surrounded by fans. So we, <laughs> we were literally, like, literally locked in the stadium because we all the staff were gathered to watch the, you know, the, the Chelsea Tottenham match and then we get out. <laughs> Did you have it so, on a big screen? Yeah, massive, well, a big screen in one of the in one of the sort of corporate lounges because we wouldn't have right. been outside, but it was... Um, it was crazy, but actually it was nice that we were all locked in together because it gave us, there was, I've never seen so many grown men crying in one place. You know, it was, it was phenomenal. It really was. And listen, I'm, I'm from a little place called Coventry, which is down the road from Leicester. And, um, and I'm a Coventry City supporter. I have been since I was four years old. Um, but this club gets under your skin and, it, you know, it was just such a, a magical time in this club's history. And, it will be forever remembered. So, and we're so grateful. I'm so grateful to have been part of that um, at that point. And you know, obviously, the last game um, where we've—it's just—it was just a surreal, surreal experience watching that yes. whole thing unfold. And we were—we put a pattern on the pitches for that one. We'd done—we'd done stars on the—I think it was stars for that one and diamonds. Um, and we'd done one for every squad player. So it was—you know—it was yeah, it was just special. And then it absolutely tonked it down with rain and ruined it all. But <laughs> It was, uh, yeah, that was it. It was, it was sobering when we walked out and, you know, you're on cloud nine and then you walk out and it absolutely dumps it down with rain for the entirety of the pre-match. So, yeah, it was, <laughs> it was, it was brilliant. It was great. It was something that will live in my memory forever. And uh, we're just so grateful to have been part of that. Um, and the club deserved it. They, and, and they still deserve all the success that hopefully they'll go on to get in the future, be it, I don't know whether they'll win the Premier League again, but... I think you know. Hopefully, once we get out of this, uh, the lower division now that we're in, I think um, you know the clubs the clubs set up for success, and I hope that it continues from. Well, I guess you can't have everything your way, can you? I mean, you'd take the Premier League and a little bit of extra rain on the last day, wouldn't you? <laughs> like the trade off was there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was worth it. It was fine. <laughs> Do you know when I first started my business? All I really did was mowing lawns. Like I think a lot of people are just like that. Mowing lawns, basic mulching stuff, things like that. That gets tiring pretty quickly. At least that was what my experience was. And, and the reality is that when I changed my model from being something that just did lawn mowing to just did basic gardening services to somebody who could identify and solve issues and do product applications, two things happened. One, I made a lot more money per hour. Clients are much more willing to pay higher money for weed control, fungicide applications, fertilization, uh, all that sort of stuff. They see it as a more technical, rightly so, more technical and thus more valuable service. So way higher hourly rates when doing those services. The second thing that happened is it gave and it reinvigorated my passion for the industry because I went from somebody who was just doing 
lowly mowing jobs seen as a low life in society by some others not but yeah you know what well, you know what it's like if you're in business to somebody who could solve people's problems to somebody who could actually help them get a beautiful place to live and i went back to really really enjoying my job again what's really cool is that we have a sponsor that literally sells every single product that i have used and use right now in my lawn care packages for my clients. And I'm honored to have them as a sponsor because the Lawn Shed, which is the sponsor, they're backed by and a partner business to uh, the Living Turf, or Living Turf, which is Australia's largest lawn product supplier. The thing about this though, is that the Lawn Shed has a trade login and they have literally designed their website and their service around small businesses. I don't know of any other business that is literally dedicated solely to small businesses. And the thing that is really great is some of you might be listening to this going, I don't know how to do product applications. That's way too technical. They've got expert advice, people who are actually willing to answer your questions. And what you will find is you're going to learn very quickly going and buying a couple of bags of fertilizers, asking for some advice, applying it on your own lawn, testing it out on some friends, seeing the results, getting the confidence from that. Same with all the other products that they could sell. That's exactly what I did, honestly. Tried it on family, tried it on my own lawn, got experience with it, asked people to use it before, went out and used it, got those amazing results. And that was the start of me turning my business from something that was, yeah, making money, but not I didn't really love it, to something that was making great money. And I really did enjoy it. If you go on the lawn shed, and this sounds like something that's going to help your business, sign up to their trade account because there's some products that you won't see on the normal account. They only provide it to small businesses. Through the trade account, they will prioritize uh, you as a small business compared to other people or other you know, businesses out there. And if you go and sign up, say that you heard us from the Australian Lawn and Garden podcast, and that will support us as a podcast. I genuinely uh, am glad to have that as a partner because the reality is is that it's a true story close to my heart uh, and it is genuinely something I believe in, not just a cash grab like some other sponsorships might have been. So jump on them, the lawn shed, the trade section, jump there. Let's get back into the podcast. What was the feeling like for you? Because... I mean, there's a lot of people involved in a Premier League squad, like, you know, the people who drive buses and the kit men and the people who clean the facilities. And it's not just there's a stadium, there's a massive training pitch. And and I think it's it's grown and developed since those days, if I'm not mistaken. So, yeah. But there's a lot of work that, that, that goes in from you and your team to, to make that happen. And yeah, you're not the guy on the, on the you're not the Jamie Vardy scoring I think eleven games in a row, or whatever it was, yeah. you know, or you know, you're not <clears throat> in Golo Conte running, you know, a quarter of the length of the earth in every single game. But you know, it wouldn't have happened without the team as a whole, the chefs and everybody else. And so, yeah, I mean, I guess that's why you got into it, wasn't it? I mean, not just to to mow some lawn and and have a you know jolly time doing it, although that's nice, but yeah, you must have felt very proud, and you know, to to just be a part of something successful. It's just a, you know, not many people in the history of the world would be able to say that they're a part of a team that won the Premier League. So, yeah. you know, no, I agree, and, and it, you're right. Operationally, um, behind the scenes of the club, everybody again was like I said was pushing in the same direction, and we all, you know, even the guys in you know marketing, commercial, ticketing, hospitality, operations, as we were all. We all just in it together, and that was the truth. And it sounds a bit cliche and a little bit like we we're it was a fairy tale, but it really was that we were all yeah. sort of had this that belief pulled us through. You know, when when it got a bit rocky, or maybe that we were, you know, thinking, or maybe it won't happen. It, it, that belief pulled us through, and I think, like you said, it it's so rewarding to be part of of that. And that's the, and it's the beauty of this industry, and it's the, is the reason I got into it. You know, I wanted to, I always wanted to be a football soccer player. Um, and I was just, I was morbidly obese as a child. So I actually had no chance of ever being an athlete, uh, although I was okay at football. And I walked into my club, Coventry City, and I grew up at the back of the stand, literally my garden backed onto the stand. And wow. I there, yeah, literally on the doorstep. And, and I went up there to volunteer and I just, I fell in love with the fact that you could work in this environment every single day of your life. 
Um, and at that point, obviously, for, for the club that I supported and loved, which was even better. And, uh, yeah, it, it's an industry that gets under your skin. And it is tough t- at times, and it's long hours, and it's unsociable hours, and, you know, a lot of the time work has to come first. Um, but the reward out of the back of it, for me personally, has been absolutely phenomenal. And I'm so grateful to have been part of an industry like this and still part of an industry like this and, you know, experience the things that I experience. And puts it in perspective a little bit, we have a, a sort of annual family barbecue day here at Leicester where we all the all the staff and their families and their children are invited to socialise and they have bouncy castles and rides and food yeah. and drink and bands and all the rest of it. Um, and you see people that aren't around this every day. So people that are coming with their friends and family that are just fans of the football club. And you get you forget how lucky and privileged you are to be around this sort of environment. And it brings it home when you see their faces as they come in and they're like, and then a player walks past them with a, you know, plate of chips in his hand and they're like, oh my God, you know, and yeah. it also shows the normality of it when, you know, they, they take time to have pictures with them and stuff. So yeah, I think, you know, I genuinely, I say it to my lads a lot of the time and I say it to people that I genuinely love what I do. Um, I genuinely love the industry and I, I genuinely feel like I've not worked a day in my entire life because I just love it. I never wake up and think, oh, I, I've got to go to work, you know, because it, it genuinely feels like just something that I love to do. And, and I'm fortunate with the team that I've got here that they all have a similar outlook and a, and a similar mindset. And it makes it a lot more enjoyable when you spend such a lot of large proportion of your life at work. So, yeah, it's it's an amazing environment to work in. And, and one, like I said, it, I advocate it because not many people understand that you can do it. The stereotypical route is sports science or physiotherapy or all those yep. things. And all those markets are saturated with graduates coming yes, out of yes. you know, university. And this is such an interesting um, space to work in. And you have got direct proximity to players. And like I say to a lot of the people here, like you look at the value of some of these squads. So you look at the, the Arsenal's of the world, the first billion pound squad. Uh, Man City right behind them, not far off that at all. Probably there now actually with a recent couple of signings. They operate 80% of their time on something that we produce. And yeah. we have a responsibility to make sure that we know what's happening underneath their feet. And they have a we have a duty to them to, to inform them of that. And we've worked really hard at Leicester over the last five years where we collect daily pitch data that gets fed into medical so that they can see the effect that our pitches have. Oh, wow. Yeah. We're, no um, way. Yeah, we are. We've got a, what we've got a full-time pitch tester. Um, we call him Clegg Hammer Sam because he's, he's more than a Clegg Hammer, but he'll go around and we test the parameters of our pitches. Uh, we've got our own testing equipment. We've got a portal, all that's uploaded immediately. Um, and then sent to physio, well, sports science, who then will analyse the effect that our pitches are having on the players. So, so you know, in in sport, every aspect of their life is tracked and monitored. Whether it's what they eat, yeah, what they yeah, eat, heart rate, and all the rest of it. Now we've worked really hard to infiltrate the sports science department, um, and now they they take our data and they overlay it with the player data to give us a, a view of when we do something to the pitch, what sort of effect does that have on a player? Um, how can we potentially reduce injury we're never going to eradicate because but we are a contributing yeah, factor because they do such a lot of work on our pitches but there's also the preparation it's also their diet their sleep and all these things but we thought it was really important to for the sports science department to understand what we're doing for them so we've now managed to manipulate the parameters which are sort of like here and here in general and we've squeezed that down to where leicester's sort of sweet spot is so we run all of our pitches within that sweet spot to make sure that the athletes get the best out of them that they can. So whether it's Jamie Vardy hitting his top loads because we know the firmness and the the way that the pitch will react to him, or maybe an older player who needs some sort of a bit less strain on the joints, we've sort of tried to find that middle ground. Um, and we're constantly working on developing that with with the guys who we work with here, um, Raw Stadia. And uh yeah, it's it's been an interesting project, but we're about five years ahead of any other football club in that space. So, and that's something that I was really passionate about getting over the line, and uh, it's working. But it's a lot more. Again, I could go on for hours, but there's a lot more to it that, that meets the eye. Right, it's not just the mowing and the that's the icing on the cake. Yeah, yeah, the science yeah. And the technology that sits behind that to actually make that happen is is for me the most important part. So, so what are you looking for and, and what are you using to measure it? Because you, you're probably not getting down and just like having to squint at it, a little bit of a lick and a sniff and just, oh, yep, no, she's all right. 
<laughs> like, yeah. the lawn's all good now. Stick my finger in a certain spot. Yeah, yeah, she's right. Yeah. Bella's good to yeah. train. Do, what yeah. are you actually using to, to test this out? Um, I mean, I, I, you know, it makes sense to me how firm and well the, the ground is holding together so that you don't have someone slip. So that makes sense. But do you look at things like, say, root density to help with that or certain – because I know that um, over here in Australia, I assume it's the same, you have synthetic stitching to hold yeah. the ground together and things like that. So is it? do you look at how thick your stitching is? Do you look at your like um, even just how long the leaf of the grass is? What, what's the sort of things that you're, you're testing? What are the key ones without giving too many secrets away to Arsenal? Uh, or those other guys, what are the key ones that you found have, have actually made the biggest difference? So, I mean, stereotypically, like you said, we, we, we've used a clegg hammer in the past to measure firmness. Now, that's developed somewhat into what we call an artificial athlete, which is still the principle of dropping a weight from a height. But the measurements we get off that are a lot more technical and a lot more detailed. Um, one thing that we've been focusing in on at, at Leicester is um, what we call energy restitution which is basically the sort of return of energy. So when a player plants, if you imagine that's the surface and the player plants yep. his foot, it's how that yep. energy moves through the surface, comes back up and through the player's leg. So we're looking Gee. at... So that's that a lot be, more than I'm doing when I'm over my lawn at home. <laughs> that's, yeah, I mean, there's a little bit more going on here. <laughs> yeah, just a, smidge, just a smidge. But we, you know, at the end of the day, it, it will, what the surface is doing below deck, as we call it, will have an effect on how quickly that comes back up the player's leg. Um, and it's not just all related to firmness. We also look at um, surface deformation, so how much the surface moves when a stud's planted into it. Um, and another big one that we've looked at here is traction. Um, so obviously we have a, a, a traction meter, so it's basically a stud plate on the bottom of a plate, and we twist it um, the 90 degrees. And then yep. where the, the pitch shears gives us a bit of a, a reading in terms of what that looks like. Because if you have too much traction, it can cause injury on knees and ankles and ligaments. Um, so you'll see in synthetic turf, for example, the traction is exceptionally high. What And yep. that's part of the contributing factor as to why you have a lot of non-contact injuries on artificial surface because the studs grip. And, and it depends yeah. on your, on what stud plate you're wearing is, is also dictated by to by the grip. Um, so we're looking at those sort of things and we, you know, we're also looking at how we can manipulate a surface to try and help the recovery of players at the minute. So, for example, if someone's returning from injury, typically they'll start on trainers in the gym, then there'll be trainers on the grass, then there'll be boots on the grass, then there'll be f full on training. So what we're looking at at the minute is can we manipulate our surfaces to allow them to come back a little bit quicker? Yeah, right. Yeah, so so we can hopefully, I mean, it's early days and it's early parts of research, but we're looking at hopefully developing a system where we manipulate certain areas of the training ground so that when they're at a certain phase of their return for recovery, we put them on that and they're on grass quicker. So if we can get that, those guys back a day quicker, that can be the difference between them playing at a weekend and not um, potentially. Yeah. So, but we've, you know, also what that does is it, it also uncovers the flaws. And I think, for us as a department, we're perfectly comfortable with accepting if things aren't right. Um, and if we are, if we have to attribute blame to what something that we've done, I'm okay with that as long as we know. Because what's happened as well in the industry, there's too much, um, you know, you hear these throwaway comments, are oh, the pitches are too hard in the Premier League, that's why we're getting so many injuries. And actually, you know what, we, we don't know. Um, it's, it is contributing because like if you have a, an accident in your car, the car is going to contribute to that accident because you're driving it. It's just, you know, an occupational hazard. Um, yeah. But we're trying to inform them now with more data. So if we had, for example, we had a concussion, a sort of mild concussion on the pitch at the stadium where a player had gone down and hit his head off the surface. Um, and the next day we were all around the table trying to understand if that part of the pitch maybe was firmer than other parts. Is that part yeah. of the reason why when he hit his head that he, he sort of felt a little bit giddy um but we're engaged in that and i'd rather be engaged in it and and try and look at a solution rather than hide under a rock and hope that no one comes to us and you know points blame at us and, and we can't defend ourselves so it's that testing has become such an important part of what we do and it, it unravels the medical side of the football squad as well um, and that makes us feel just that little bit more part of it and it might be marginal gains one percent um, but it is a, is an important part of the puzzle when it comes to, you know, players performing at the weekend and in training. So two things are coming to mind for me. <clears throat> the first is I know that that over 
especially in Europe and North America, uh, with golf greens, right? Because the roots, as they grow over time, they break down, create more organic, organic matter in the soil. The greens get too soft. <laughs> the golf balls plug. And so then they add sand through uh, like machines that are sort of injected in. I'm ex- you know this, John, of course. Yeah, yeah. I'm explaining this to some people who who, who may not be in, uh, in that side of the industry. So I know that over time the soil gets softer, right? That seems to be the way things go. So what do you do if you go, no, this is too soft? or Because I can see if it's too firm, I, my guess would be you'd probably aerate it, might, something like that. If it's too soft, what do you do? The second thing is, do you have, because you have a bunch of training pitches. It's not like there's one training pitch and that's it, right? Yeah, you have a bunch of training pitches, 21. Is that including artificial or that's just all grass? Yeah, so that's include, that's all grass pitches. And then we've got two and a half uh, synthetic as well, full size. And is it, and one of those is indoors? I yeah, one take indoors, it? one full size indoor, one full size outdoor, and then sort of two quarter pitch cage pitches so they're, they're in a cage so yeah it's yeah it's a lot of so lots of this and, and, and a nine hole golf and a nine hole and nine hole golf course because that really helps yeah, <laughs> we, something else that, to, to look after that's that's just for you that's just for you at the weekends isn't it <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just John and his staff go play so that's a lot so 21 pitches and they're about a hectare each right close yeah, roughly, to that yeah give or take so well man that's two hundred thousand square meters is that right? Yeah. You're probably working in feet and yards, aren't you? Yeah. We're, we're, <laughs> well, we're not really. He's the old money. We're square meet. We are square meters, to be fair. But yeah, typically, a... typically with the surrounds, it's it's about eight eight and a half thousand square meters per per area. So it's a lot. But the training ground itself, the new training ground. Sorry to go off on a tangent. It's um it's 181 acres. So um because we've got 12 acres of forest, we've got a nine-hour golf course, we've got 36 That's acres crazy. of landscaping. And then the pitch is in the middle. So, yeah, a lot of space to cover. That's why our team is so big. It's funny that you have that much um, uh, in England, of all places. I mean, you could come to Australia. We have a third of your population, about six million times the amount of land you have. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and I'm looking around my city thinking, where the hell would you fit that much space for all <laughs> that much training ground? What did you... What did you do? Just you scare people out of their homes? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> land? Like, you, you, man, you, back you. to it. We acquired a golf course. That's how we did it. So we oh, built it on the golf right. and built it on that the golf makes course. sense. You so go. you probably got rid of nine holes. Is that right? Yeah, that's it. Okay. So, I mean, let's see. That makes sense. There you go. So it was pre-existing. So uh, where was I going? Oh, the second thing is, you, I mean, do you have? So the first thing I wanted to answer, I want you to ask you know, back to the question is, is how do you firm up things? Do you rip everything out or do you inject stuff? The second thing is, do you have different pitches say you have like pitch b is very firm and pitch h or whatever you, you categorize them as really soft and maybe someone's come back from an injury and they might want to do some slow jogging on the soft pitch and so you go out there and the firm pitch might sort certain different people or is it all trying your best to keep them uniform as possible yeah so first question we do strip everything out every year so we don't tend to, to suffer with the issues that obviously you see in golf because golf's an accumulation like you said of of yep. you know dead matter debris organic matter building up and creating that thatchy layer which creates the softness and you know affects the ball um and you know so so we every single year will clean out the pitches but you have to bear in <laughs> mind it, in effect in effect those pitches are a sandpit that's what it is it's it's just a big sand pit um so right. we're not on soil we're not indigenous soil we are basically almost 100 percent sand with a with a drainage layer at the bottom be that gravel carpet or some you know we've got a yep. creek system at the stadium which retains the water so um so, so very similar to like a uspga, USPGA green, green, sort of. absolutely it's, it's almost are you using the same sand Similar. I mean, we tend to use a, a root zone in the upper 100 millimetres. So in the we have the lower 200, which is like a semi-coarse sand. And then the upper 100 millimetres is um, like a 90-10 mix. Um, but 
typically predominantly sand because we we operate a winter sport effectively i know we do a lot of it in the summer and the spring but it is a winter sport so the the whole point of that is to make sure they drain in the winter when it's critical yes, yes. um and every year we clean the pitches out completely so we scratch them back to bare soil or stitching that exists in there as you mentioned with these hybrid pitches we've got stitched element to them um and that goes we go back to basics every year because a big thing that we push here a big thing that is pushed I'd say in the Premier League across all the guys that work in the Premier League is we call pitch hygiene um, and it's about making sure that the surface is clean at all times because the dead matter can cause you a whole load of agronomical problems with disease um, right. but also what we've looked at with our testing is is the the interaction with the players studs so if we have a build-up of organic matter and, and that turns into anaerobic sort of slimy material on the top the players can't penetrate the stud through the surface and there's more chance of slipping. Now, my worst nightmare, I don't know what it's like for some of the other Premier League lads, but my worst nightmare is players slipping. You know, I imagine yeah. the 94th minute and there's a pen, there's a penalty for to get in the Champions League or to win the league. And the oh, my goodness. Slipping. Yeah. yeah. John and, and, Terry, Champions yeah. League final, you know, yeah. missed the penalty to win it. Exactly. You know, it happens, and, doesn't it? It happens and sometimes it's avoidable, sometimes it's unavoidable, but I don't want to be the person that they come looking for if we lose out on hundreds of millions of pounds of prize money. So um, that is true. <laughs> yeah. And that's the, so I've you know, we work really hard on pitch hygiene. We work really hard to make sure the surface is as clean as possible so that the players get the best interaction. Now, what I can't control is some of the stupid choices they make with boots. Um, you know, I know that they want bright pink boots and I know that they want this, but very rarely do they look at the stud plate you know it's fashionable to wear blades but if you imagine a blade has a surface area like this yep. and that and that trying to penetrate a surface in any you, you know it's trying to it's like trying to put i don't know um the flat end of a fork into a pin board it just won't happen but if you've got a stud which is round and like this yep straight in straight out so you know we're trying to educate as well, but you know again we don't want to influence over influence. There's a lot of work going on in the background about different stud plates and the effect they have on traction, um, and we're hopeful to you know help maybe just inform them that you know a sensible stud plate will help them perform a little bit better. But yeah, it's um, going back to that. Yeah, the original question it is um, we strip them out and that's how we keep keep them clean. Um, and in terms so of the how unit, do you how do you firm up a surface if it's too soft? I mean, we would we would look to. It depends on again. It depends on the soil structure. So obviously, on our pitches, they can get too soft if we've done a heavy renovation operation where we've turned them over. So periodically, on our fiber sand pitches, for example, which is a proportion of like we call it like horse hair, but it's like fibrous stuff that's mixed into the sand to give the stability. If you do that and and turn it over too deep, it can stay soft for a very long time. So in that instance, it's it's water and roll and just try and promote the root system to try and lock the whole thing out. That's that's the main thing. Um, right. And but obviously, if you if you're rolling and rolling on indigenous soil, you can cause yourself even more problems. Um, so there's, there's ways and means, but you know, sand typically when it's wet is firm. So the the wetter the better yes. in terms of holding. So you imagine a beach, you've got fluffy sand where the waves aren't, and then you go where the waves have been, and it's solid as a rock and Principle in sports surf is no different in terms of creating that sort of firmness. Um, but we don't work with soil pitches here. Um, we don't work with the indigenous soil. So, you know, we don't often need to firm them up. We need to dry them out if it is indigenous. Um, but yeah, our firmness comes from uh, watering and rolling in its simplistic terms, but the reliance on the root system would be more advantageous for us. So yeah, it's uh, that's how we do that. And then on to the second part, which is, you know, do we manipulate pitches differently? Um, it's not something we do. We're doing it, as I said to you previously, about certain areas we're going to manipulate. So it might be a warm-up grid or you know, to, to enhance recovery. Um, but in terms of the actual pitches, my my motive here is, is that whether you're seven years old and just coming through the academy or whether you're first team, our pitches will be consistent. Um, they're fed the same, they're treated the same. The usage is here or there about the same. The only difference we've got is the hybrid element of those pitches. So our academy, for example, don't they have fully constructed surfaces like the USJ spec of a green. Um, but what they don't have is stitching because there's no need for the stability because the, the players at seven years old haven't got the force and the load that is going to move the surface too much. Um, but as you progress into professional, um, you're relying on that sort of um, reinforcement to, to hold the surface together because the load is really heavy. When a, 
a professional player full you know maybe sort of 60 70 80 some of them 90 kilograms put their full force and put the brakes on you need it to yeah. hold and that's why we rely on the, the stitching and the the fiber sand to do that for us but in terms of the the height of cut and the consistency that is consistent across the board because for me it's important that there's no surprises as you move through your age groups to you know if there's a style of football that style of football should run through the entire football club therefore our pitches should play the same in my opinion and that's my opinion lots of people have different ways of doing things but that's just the way that i like things done here well i'm not going to challenge your opinion it, man, it is obvious that you love this stuff. Hey, like you, you laugh it up. This is, <clears throat> yeah. I mean, there's a, there's one thing that's. I mean, my mind goes some weird places sometimes, right? I mean, we probably all do. But yeah. as you're talking about this, I've I've noticed this myself. We, so what we do in in what I do in the industry, John, is is I just work in the residential market, and we do quite high end work, all things considered. But there's one of these things that crosses my mind as I'm doing these jobs where I'm like, can you imagine being a caveman and they're just fast forwarding to today and yeah. being like your ancestor's entire role is cutting lawn? You know what <laughs> I mean? Like how yeah. absurd would that be for somebody who's trying to just survive on the savannah yeah. and Not hunt an antelope? <laughs> exactly. Just like oh, it's just you know, they're, they're on death's doorstep and they finally <laughs> caught a fish or something like that and someone transports them forward. To this conversation right now, yeah, <laughs> just it's, going. It's nice. so it's... when we stitch the lawn together, it's like <laughs> wow. And I mean, sometimes, I mean, just let's look at it from a positive, I don't mean it from a negative, just how blessed are we as people mm. that this is life, this is a mm. career. I mean, there's so many things to get upset about in, in the world, but in reality, we're doing pretty well to have such. I mean, and, and people as well, just I mean, the, the I've no, I had no idea about all this stuff that you go through. But I don't know, does that, does that stuff ever cross your mind or is that just me about it this is, the caveman it, stuff? I mean, maybe I, I don't quite go back to the caveman days, but, I'll, um, <laughs> but I also I always go back to when I started and I look at the, if the 13-year-old me could see where we are now. Um, I don't think I'd believe it because, you know, obviously it was, it was a sort of um, a, a very basic operation back then. You know, the pitches... They'd only just about discovered that sand was a good idea for the pitches at that point when I joined because a lot of the pitches. Gee, that's had not long ago. That's yeah, not long ago, I, really. I've been I've been in the industry now. If you include the volunteering I did between thirteen and sixteen, you know, I've been in the industry twenty five years this year. Um, but back then, you know, sand was just something that you threw on to try and dry the pitch out. And now we're looking at these surfaces that hold that have 100% grass cover all year round, and the technology that's available to us to effectively recreate summer in winter. You know, we're heating pitches, we're putting artificial light sources on pitches to replicate yeah, sunshine. Yeah. Um, we're spraying pitches for recovery. We're treating it like athletes. The nutrition, the technology behind the nutrition we apply is is phenomenal compared to where it used to be. Um, and but there are the fundamentals and the basics that still exist, which is nice because we haven't lost everything and everything hasn't been given up to sort of artificial intelligence just yet. Um, but, you know, but again, that might need, need to be a change we embrace. We might fast forward 20 years and there might be one person managing an entire site like this with robots. Who knows? But, you know, the fact is, is that we have to embrace that change and move forward. And we definitely do that. But I'm the same as you. I, I do often think back to those days where I worked, walked through the gates of Coventry City and I was picking grass out of the, the track around the outside. I was, you know, emptying grass into a skip and I was in the skip half the time trying to, you know, stamp it down and, <laughs> and make room. And I was sweeping the floors and making the tea and just, you know, just being a general nuisance. Um, and, and how far we've come now, you know, I'm sat, as I'm speaking to you now, I'm sat in our the Sports Surf Academy, which is, you know, was a brainchild of mine to try and, and develop, you know, the talent within the industry that exists. Um, I look out my office and I've got, you know, floor to wall glass and a balcony out the front and a, a massive building with offices and staff and 53 staff at the minute. It's, it's, it's crazy. It's nuts. And even I have to, every day I walk in, I, I sort of pinch myself that this is where we are. You know, it is, it's phenomenal really how far we've come. This is one of the things that, you know, how I said before that we love about 
the Premier League is how the underdog has the potential to come up. But when I was looking at your story, starting off at Coventry, um, so if I'm not mistaken, you you were there, you were an apprentice, you eventually you went away somewhere else, you came back as a head groundskeeper there, and then you went to Leicester, but Leicester weren't in the Premier League at that stage, were they? No, they were in the Championship. And so then you've gone up into the Premier League, and and I mean, there's another famous moment with Leicester. That's uh, that penalty, you know, the penalty that was missed at the end. And uh, was that when you guys missed out on? I mean, I'm bringing up bad memories now, isn't it? Is, am I remembering this correct? Troy Deeney for Watford, I believe, scored at the other end, and yeah, there's a playoff. Was... I mean, emotional roller coaster. Were you there for that? I wasn't there for that one, but I was there. Just I was there at the end of the year. We got promoted to the Premier League. I joined in the January. And we got promoted in the May. Um, and, you know, yeah, it's it, it, my journey's been crazy, really. I've, I, again, started at Coventry um, and worked my way through the ranks and then moved to Aston Villa, it was at the time. So, right. moved to Aston Villa. I was there for 14 months looking after their brand new training facility, um, working under Jonathan Calderwood, who, again, is another, you know, great guy within the industry, working at Paris Saint Germain now. Um, oh, really? Yeah, he's, uh, yeah, he's, he moved. Um, God, he must have been there 10 years now, I think. And he was a great mentor for me um, in terms of showing me what standards were really about um, and, and how to, to achieve the highest sort of possible standards out of pitches. And another guy who's just obsessed with his work, obsessed with his job, absolutely loves yep. it. Um, so me and him, as you can imagine, got on like a house on fire. Um, and then, <laughs> yes, uh, I can tell. <laughs> yeah, and then, uh, and, then I came, and then I came back to Coventry to take the headman's job. I was only 23. I was young. I was relatively that's crazy yeah it was and it was it was it was scary because Coventry were in the depths of trouble but it was a step back for me I mean I took a pay cut to do that um to go back to that job because it I knew it was a step back to take a step forward in the long run um and you know Coventry with my club and all that sort of stuff and that was my first experience of like being the person that has to make decisions and everything lives and dies by you. And, I, you know, I made some absolutely terrible mistakes in that period. And, you know, I'm not, no, yeah, not I, you. Honestly, honestly, yeah, you, you would not be lauded any praise on me for some of the pictures I've managed to produce there, but we were, we were limited with resource. We had, our, our hands were behind our back. Um, I remember a conversation at Coventry that I had to have where we had to make a choice between making um, a budget cut or losing staff. You know, so I had to take a 60% budget cut in, in order to retain the staff. And that year, the pitch just at the stadium in particular just fell off the face of the earth. Um, but what I maintained through that is, is that even when we were mowing no grass, it was just basically like a mud bath. I still put a string down because that was just the way we did things. Um, and, you know, they, they taught me a lot at Coventry that we went through the mill. We, we were relegated to League One. Um, no way. Yeah, stadium That's only. all the way. How, all how the many way. tiers down? That's three league, tiers down, right? League two, league two is the is sort of like the lowest tier in professional football, and um, and yeah, and it was, and then the stadium ownership fell out with the the football club, and I had to make a choice whether to work for the stadium or the football club because oh, it was all. Man. So yeah, we, I, listen, I, we I've I've seen every element of sort of literally almost bottom to top, and. It, but it, it's rounded me really, really well, I think, to sort of deal with situations and know how fortunate we are at Leicester, how fortunate we were at Aston Villa. And, you know, it's made me appreciate the good times even more because of, because of the turmoil that I've been through it, sort of living and dying with Coventry City as it, as it was. But, you know, they're on the up now as well and, and it's nice to see them doing well. But, yeah, it's it's not been a straightforward sort of, yeah, uh, straightforward curve. And I, I say it to my guys all the time because... A lot of them see the position I'm in now. Um, they see the nice building that we're in and we operate out of. And as I say, I think they think I was born with a silver spade up my ass. Um, but, you know, in t I just it hasn't <laughs> happened for me. I, you know, I, I grew up on a grew up on a council estate and, and, and with parents that had not a lot of money. And but, you know, I grew up with love and support. And that's all I've ever had. And people think that I've sort of just landed in this from a, a foreign planet into this seat and that's what you know and that's my job now but i've done all the jobs that they've done i've, I've been in some really crappy situations skip, some skip bins apparently at cover yeah. three city <laughs> trying to tread out yeah. all those, all yeah. those i love that story i just love that it's you 13 yeah. year old you and and look at you now you know and yeah. I, mean, look, I left school i left school's like a straight i was straight a student at school i wasn't 
I didn't love school, but I didn't mind school. Um, and I left with really, really good grades at school. And the teachers were screaming at me saying, you must go to university. You must do something with your life. It's such a waste of talent going into this job. And um, But I loved it. I didn't care. I absolutely loved it. And I knew that's what I wanted to do. And I think that's what's helped me sort of with the success I've had in my career and hopefully will continue to have. Um, you know, it's because I love what I do. Simple as that. Now, you've got some news that you announced two weeks ago, which yeah. or, or roughly two weeks ago, and um, that's some pretty special stuff. So you've um, your time at Leicester has come to an end. My my guess would be that it had something to do with the relegation and, and things like that. Uh, maybe that's got nothing to do with it at all. But um, we actually talked. That's I, I mean, you. I, I highly doubt that you listened to the podcast that we did with Wally. But we talked about it because he was talking about you and and all that sort of stuff. And then I was like, they just got relegated. And I, was, I wonder how that affects their budget and this because it's it's like a hundred million dollars plus difference or pounds or something, whatever it is. Yeah. But um, you've just um, now you're still wearing a Leicester shirt. You're still using you know, your Leicester email, at least when we're organizing this. So you must be in a transition, but you're moving to Manchester City. For those who don't know, Manchester City last year won everything, right? They just bullied the entire world, right? It was close, to be honest. I mean, the Arsenal had a run at it, but they won the Premier League, the Champions League, the FA Cup, right? They won the hearts and souls of just about everybody. They've got probably the best coach of all time, Probably the best young player, you know, going around right now. You know, just, I mean, there's what maybe in English football, five teams at that level, you know, with with what they've achieved over the last 15, 10 years. And then in the world, what, another six, seven, eight? You know, it's, there's only, there's only 10 positions at that level, John, in the world. And you've just taken it. I mean, how does that feel? Yeah, it was um, so. Well, yes. Yeah, so, so to start, I'm two days away from finishing at Leicester. So uh, I finished my last day is actually tomorrow. Um, so this will probably be the last time I speak to anybody in a in a Leicester top, apart from my staff. So yeah, it's. Um, but it, you know, it hasn't been an easy decision for me. Mate, you know, and on, on the face of it, I understand the timing of what I announced looked like it was after the relegation, but um, the decision was made around March, April last year. Um, but out of respect for the club and the position they were in at the time, I didn't think it was right for me to start announcing that I was jumping ship. Um, and obviously, we've been in the process of like a three-month handover um, to hand over to, to my successor. So, um, yeah, it's, it's been a difficult decision. Leicester, as I've said to you there, you know, Leicester's become part of my family. Um, it's become part of my life. Um, and it, it'll be a club that will forever stay in my heart because of the, the type of club it is. Um, it's a club that everyone seems to love, um, which is it was rightly so, rightly so for oh, the very hundred percent for the way that you know from the outside looking in, you'll see how it's operated and how how we move and shake things, and you know that is um, it's a genuine club. It really is a special, special place. But you know, I'm a I'm a block planner. I'm a five, ten, fifteen year planner, um, and I looked at what more I could achieve at Leicester in the next five years. Um, I've got a young family as well and and moving them in five, ten years time may be more tricky as you know, they move into hormones sure. and boyfriends yes. and lots of friends and I'll be public enemy number one. And um, me and my wife took a long time to make a decision to, to move. Um, but the opportunity at a club like Manchester City, um, I'll be doing a lot of work across the group of football clubs. So they, as you may know, they own football yes. clubs across the world. Uh, one in they Australia. got one here in Australia. Yeah, they do. Uh, so, and, you know, I think what, what my role will encompass is, is all of those clubs in some capacity, whether it's just advisory, whether it's, you know, project management, whether it's in actually going out and actually been involved in building something at those clubs. And that was the exciting bit for me and, and the challenge that awaits me. But, you know, we um, also have some stuff to do at Manchester City first in terms of, you know, aligning what we're doing there and trying to, you know, understand how they work and operate and hopefully bring some of what we've built at Leicester to Manchester City and improve things there. So, you know, I'm excited by it, um, but it wasn't a, a straightforward decision. Lots of factors, um, lots to consider, but I'm um, now sort of, we what we've built here at Leicester is 
the opportunity for internal progression. And that's exactly what's happened. Um, I've got the, the Sports Surf Academy, which, you know, I'm sort of the figurehead of and the and department. And they sit sort of side by side. And I was over the top of that, along with our other club, the other club we've got in Belgium and our polo farms in London. Um, and now we've split that role into two. And the guys that are reporting into me have, have now taken that role, which is what we've always worked, worked for. You know, I always said to my guys, I want to work myself to redundancy where I'm not needed anymore. And when I'm not needed, it will be your turn to take over. And that is exactly what's happened. And so I'm really, really proud of what we've built. I'm really, really proud of the guys that are around me that will take my role. Um, I'm glad and happy that we've we've managed to do that. And um, yeah, it's uh, it's been it's been sad. Over overall, it's, it's a sad of time course. for me to leave. And you know, such a but. I leave behind hopefully a legacy and that that was always really important to me and hopefully i can build the same thing at, at manchester city with uh you know with the opportunities that present themselves there so yeah it's um i'm sort of i can put to bed leicester um as after tomorrow and then really start to look forward to the move into manchester and uh and see what we can achieve there hopefully some good things you know, you guys, I, I said this to Matt when he came on the podcast. I was like, I, were you drunk when you said yes? <laughs> he came on two days before a World Cup quarterfinal. <laughs> and, and I sent you a message and I was like trying to be really respectful. Be like, I know you just changed job. I'd love to have the interview. You know, you let me know. You suggested this date. <laughs> like, <laughs> mate, what are you, are you drinking a little bit too much? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, joking, but listen it's it's great it's i think it's it's any opportunity that we can get to talk about the industry the platform that obviously you've created to get people talking and you know it's amazing it's great and although i will admit i haven't listened to the podcast before i, I certainly will be listening to it after this um, and i will definitely won't be listening to mine unfortunately because i hate the sound of my voice so i will um i'll listen to everyone else's but probably avoid this one um, but um, but any opportunity we get to promote the industry, any opportunity we, you know, I've got, I'm really fortunate the platform I've got. I'm really fortunate that the, the attention that my move got, which was unbelievable. It was weird. You know, the amount of- You were in the work. news. I, 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 I can't even explain it. It's the oddest thing, but part of me is also quite happy because again, it, it gets people talking about the industry and that that's the purpose. And there's lots of people that have lots of opinions about me. Um, they think that is this is about me, um, but they do that without really listening to to what I've got to say. And I will always maintain that everything that I do is to try and better the industry, and it comes from a good place. And it, listen, by proxy, it's me, it's my face, and it, you know it is what it is. And the exposure is is I get a lot of that exposure, but I sometimes think, well, if I don't, who does? You know, and it, I think we've all, especially the guys in the Premier League, we've got a great platform. Um, we don't have to say a lot, but you know, we'd have to say something to try and get people attracted into the industry and get passionate about what they want to achieve. And this industry can give you so much. And you know, same as you guys, you know, talking about it is just it's amazing. It's amazing. It's what should be happening. So yeah, you should be proud of yourself too, because uh, you know, that's what it's all about. Well, thank you. And um I'm so offended you haven't listened. <laughs> I'm joking. Sorry. A podcast on Australian Lawn and Garden, and I can't believe the the Premier League manager is not listening to it. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> the what I was gonna one of the things I was really interested in is because I employ people, yeah, and I've always struggled to find great staff. It's just the industry, and I think it's stupid. We've talked about this many times. Just as you hinted at here, and I loved what you said, you rejected what your teacher said about going to university. I think university is great. Also overrated. Both things can be true at once because I think most people have this, there's such a passion and such a love and such a great joy that comes from working out in nature, whether that's farming or whatever it is. But what we do when it comes to any type of gardening, any type of lawn care, whether that's Premier League, Premier League pitch or, or mowing your aunt's, you know, if, because she can't do it herself or whatever it is. You get the satisfaction when you turn around at the end, I made that thing look beautiful. And there is something about it that is missing in the everyday office job that you just don't get. And there's different pleasures and, and, and satisfactions that come with that other stuff. But I think the industry has been underrated. And and the pay, I mean, I'm, I'm 
I'm assuming, but I might be wrong here, that the Premier League probably has oodles of money. I would sound that what was happening at Coventry and these challenges you had there was was quite a challenge to get people, you know, in in there with your budget constraints you had. But do you find it very difficult? It sounds like it sort of is to convince people to come to something that is actually a fantastic job, and. Is that the case, or do you find that because it's the Premier League, you have everybody coming from around the world? And my third question is, how do I apply for a job at Man City? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, listen, you, you're right. It is um, even in this in this country we struggle, um, and I think what we've, you know, the industry shifted a little bit, really, in my opinion. And I think that we have to, as much as we love what we do, and, and it was done in a certain way, our way. We can't hide from the fact that there's been a cultural shift in, in people's priorities. And we talk about it here all the time. Um, you know, I, I if you'd have asked my staff 10 years ago, what's your priority? Is it time or money? They'd say money, 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 money. Give me money. Give me overtime. I'll work 60 hours a week. Um, if I ask them today, they'll say time. They want balance. They want a lifestyle. They want to be able to spend the money by making time yes. with their families. Um, yeah, yeah. And I think... I think some of the trick that we've missed potentially as an industry is, is that people that are, you know, been in the industry a long time, including myself, um, can be stuck in that sort of prehistoric era saying, well, in my day, we had to work 60 hours and not complained. The world isn't like that anymore. <laughs> you know, and, and listen, yeah. there will be people that will go above and beyond. And usually they are, with you know, it's, it's factual. They're the ones that tend to get on. The ones that do a little bit more, go that extra mile, are the ones that get on. But the world needs people that want to work from eight till four because that helps the world go around. Yeah. Not everybody is made in the same mold. And I think if we don't embrace that uh, and, and keep it as an industry that yes, is um, um, sort of, you know, is unsociable, then unfortunately, um, you know, we're not gonna attract those those people because they're not gonna wanna come in because they're, they, we're trying to work them too hard. And listen, I'm, I'm all for not being too soft. I don't want, to, <laughs> I don't wanna be too soft um but equally the people that want to get on will get on um you know we launched the sports stuff academy here at leicester city um in order to try and attract talent and try and like you say you're almost trying to sell yourself all the time because it is an industry that's not the first off the tongue when your careers advisors are talking to you yeah um, you know and it's 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 tricky it's difficult because you feel like you're trying to justify yourself every step of the way and that's really really hard sometimes um, but in, the more that people, like I said, that like myself and the other guys in the Premier League use their platform to promote um, you guys doing podcasts, the guys in this country doing podcasts, making it more available and accessible, the more we can sell it and the more inspirational we can be. And if we as managers are adaptive to change and adaptive to the fact that the workforce that's coming through is not going to want to be here for 60 hours a week, they're going to want to be home and out with their friends and spending time. And we can balance that. So when you're at work, you're at work and you're here. But when you're at home, let them be at home. Let them have their time. You know, don't interrupt that time. Be respectful of that time. Then that's the next sort of culture that's coming through. And as managers, we have to be adaptive to that. Um, it, it, in terms of the pay, the pay is a, is an eternal struggle, um, despite where you are, even in the Premier League. And that that's an industry thing. So it doesn't matter if you're in the Premier League or if you're in League One. It depends on who's fighting that battle. And again, I think for me, unfortunately, we all work in silos. So what we pay at Leicester may be different to what they pay at you know, United, might be different to what they pay at Brighton and, and all the rest of it. Um, and I think the industry probably needs a bit of governance for that. Um, I'm not a big fan of, of union, unionization, but it gets results and it sets a framework and stops people sitting on the fence when it comes to expectations. And, you know, every other sort of industry seems to have that representation. And we have got some great representation here in the, the Grounds Managers Association and Bigger for Golf, for example. Um, but they're, they're, they can't put their hat on the rack and say, if you don't pay this sort of salary, if you don't attract this sort of talent, then they're well within their rights to walk out and leave it. And then good luck to you. Two days in the summer of not cutting pitches, they'll soon realise yeah. that we're missing. Um, but, but obviously you've got an industry full of people that are proud of what they do. So to walk away and to take that stance probably wouldn't work. But I think all we can do is forge the way in terms of, you know, fighting for better paying conditions because we have to have that balance. You know, we can give them the time, but they still want to be paid well for a job that they're, you know, we're professionals. We want to be viewed as professionals. Yes. Be paid yes. like professionals. That's the truth. Um, 
and it's different in different countries with you know the different sort of labor and migrant labor and all that sort of stuff and that doesn't exist here obviously um but it's uh it's tricky to navigate but we've got to just keep banging the drum and and try and set a precedent i think for for better paying conditions and conditions been just as important as pay um and if you want to apply for a job at man city then you know let, we'll see I, I don't know i don't know what the travel time will be like every day for yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, probably a, probably a twelve-hour flight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah if we can fun. get the flight to a, if we get the flight to eleven hours, right, and an yeah. hour on boarding on and off, I can spend about a minute there on site yeah. and then Sounds get back home. And, well, <laughs> like, like, there and gets your work-life balance, so you'll be well away. You've got, you've got your time. <laughs> yes, my wife and my two kids won't won't mind at all. The, yeah. it must be. I mean. You're a professional, you know, and you can clearly see that you love what you do. And I'm sure that there's somebody, you know, being at the top and um, I don't even know what you, you get paid. I'm not heading down that path at all. But but um, being at the top, I'm sure that they reimburse you well. It must be difficult, though. You've got 53 people underneath you at, at Leicester. There are guys in the Premier League, and I, I have no begrudging them whatsoever, who are on 100, 200, 300,000 pounds a week, right? You're telling me you're ripping out. I mean, were you ripping out all 21 fields, training fields every year? Unstated, when I, yeah. when we had Matt Oliver on, he had a problem with an Ed Sheeran concert five days before a, I think it was a rugby league match. Yeah. And they ripped out the grass, had the stadium and then relayed grass, had five days, one more week, right? So what's that? 12 ish days. And they had eight rugby league games. I think it was league in one weekend, in one weekend. And he was criticized and this and that, whatever. And I said, how much does it cost? And he said, it's well into seven figures, right? Which is well over a million Australian dollars, five or 600,000 pounds equivalent. So I'm doing the maths in my head as you're saying that, because it will be very, I'm sure it'd be fairly similar. Maybe they've got more, more difficulty being inside the stadium, not in an open field, but like huge costs involved and obviously 53 staff would be a massive payroll <clears throat> even you know when you're paying you know a, a, a lower wage but it must be in the back of your head going some of these guys maybe not at Leicester but you know at Man City or at Man United or you know Real Madrid they're earning insane numbers you know and it must be like, hey, can we have like, I don't know, like 10% of that? You know, <laughs> it's just like 1% might, might help us a little bit. Does that ever cross your mind? It, it doesn't, it doesn't. I think I learned quite early um, to separate football because it, it sits in, on a planet of its own in terms of finance. Um, but also those are the guys that, that ensure that the revenue comes in. So no one will pay true. their ticket or their, their TV subscription to watch me cut the pitch, you know, and... <laughs> I would argue. Well, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe you and my mum, and that's probably about it. Yeah. That's, that's about really ten bucks a week, mate. Pay the wage bill, but you know, I think we have to. I think we always have to understand that we we have a role to play, um, and we facilitate great sport, great entertainment, concerts, whatever it may be, um, and we're part of that puzzle. But alongside us, behind the operation, there's fifty three of me, but there's another, you know, three four hundred employees at the football club. That make it all yeah. tick so to pay all them somewhere near the football money is would be yeah. uneconomical so i think what i say to my guys is that when they announce that they're paying such and such x amount of money per week we can't get lost in that world because we're not in that world if you wanted to be in that world we should have all been footballers and we're not yeah um but you know i do my bit internally to fight our corner in terms of professionalism and support for our staff and and sort of reimbursement for our staff and you now i will say here you know i'm i'm paid well um but i've never once asked for a pay rise not once not in my entire not in my entire career have i gone back to the club and said i need more money i've just proved myself and let them come to me and as my responsibility's grown and as my remit has grown um my salary's grown accordingly and you know i'm quite proud of the fact that i've never been in and bartered for money i've never been in and held the club to ransom um, yeah. And I believe that, you know, what someone said to me, because I find it quite difficult talking about um, money and salary, you know, especially sort of when you're in negotiations with a new club or whatever. Um, and someone said to me, look, don't look at it as money. Look at it as what you're worth. You know, what is your worth to that football club, that organisation, that operation? 
um, and how do you value yourself? Um, and and that was an important part for me to get that stigma out of my head about the cold hard negotiations around what mm. you're going to pay someone, you know. So it's uh, yeah, it's tricky, but there is there's definitely not a big pot of gold. You have to fight for it. There's a there's a there's a fair pot of money in the Premier League and, and at these clubs, um, but everyone's fighting for the same pot. So I think again, it, it boils down to the person in the chair at the time and who can fight and what they can fight for and see what they can get and. That comes from structure and organisation and, and reputation. Um, someone said to me the other day, and it's something that we'll talk about when I get to Manchester, is, is that effectively what we've done at Leicester is build a brand, a department that's a brand. Um, and when you build a brand, people want to support it. People want to be part of it. People want to you know, endorse it and, and support your projects and ambitions and all the rest of it. And I think that's was really poignant for me that I, they feel that, that we've created that. You know, we're not like a, you know, we haven't got a, a ad campaign or a logo or anything like that, but we've got a certain way of Wait, doing you things. do You do have a logo in the middle of the picture about seven years ago. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's not about that one. Um, but, you know, we, uh, I know what you mean, though. Yeah, we've created that. And, and I think that's what's helped us secure the projects. And, and it's helped me be involved in some huge projects at the football club and see things that not many people in the head of department um, get to see because um, we're valued and we're valued because of what we bring to the table. And, the equivalent of what we've achieved here at Leicester and in the years I've been here, we've been sort of either winning grounds team of the year for the UK every other year, um, which is the equivalent of, I guess, winning the league in football. Yeah. Um, um, and if we've not won it, we've been runner up or in the mix of the top three or four clubs in the country. We're competing against the big boys. We're competing against the Arsenal's, the United's of the world that, you know, I've got great reputations for producing great pitches. And, you know, we've put ourselves in that space and we've commanded that space for a long time. And that's been part of building the brand. And that helps you get commitment from ownership and the board as well. So all those little tools that create that brand, if you want to call it that, have helped us the, with the success that we've had as a team. So, yeah, I'm really proud of that. So now that you've moved to Manchester City or about to move to Manchester City, one of the richest clubs in the world, how many Lamborghinis do you get paid a week? Is it seven, <laughs> eight? I've got maybe a Rolls like one, Royce on the side. One toy one. That's all. I think uh, <laughs> but Lamborghinis, Lamborghini do make tractors, so maybe we'll get one of them. That's no. true. Yeah, yeah. Do you but, watch uh, do you watch Clarkson's Farm? Yeah, yeah. I love, yeah. I love that show. That's, That's so good. Yeah, it's very, very typically him, that is. But um <laughs> but again, listen, I as I've, from what I, the little I've seen of, of how it works at Manchester City, and I won't really know fully until I'm in there, it will be like any other business. Listen, it, there's, there is a lot of money floating around, for, again, for players, and they, yeah. they invest really heavily in the infrastructure in terms of the, they've got this new stand expansion and hotel and development and indoor arena happening at the stadium, which is all exciting stuff. But everything from what I can see and hear so far, it has to go through a process like it does at Leicester. It's not a bottomless pit of money. Everything has yeah. to be justified um, to the nth degree. And that's how we work here. That's how I work here. That's what we've created here at Leicester. And that's exactly what I'm expecting when we go to Manchester City. So um, just my, you know, electric milk float, as I call it. That's my milk float is mine. Uh, there'd be no Lamborghinis or, um, or <laughs> that's if I was knocking around to drive me into work every day. No. Well, uh, <laughs> moving on from the joke, and uh, obviously, you know, uh, I wasn't serious, but for those who might have thought I was, the I'm really interested, moving on to Manchester City and a technical aspect for the turf. One of the things I really wanted to ask you, well, there's a couple of things about um, that we haven't even touched on. I feel like we've touched on just about everything, and then I look at my notes, I'm like, oh, man, there's so much <laughs> still to go. Have you got another seven hours left for this podcast? Yeah, 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 I think you might you might lose a few listeners if we go on for seven hours. But but surprisingly, I mean, this has fascinated me. It's a complete side um, subject. People really do listen to the end of these. And, you know, we've yeah. we got a podcast that's like two and a half hours long, and I can't remember what exactly it is, but more than half the listeners made it to the end. And I was really? like, wow. Amazing. Yeah. I so, <laughs> the I think they will. So, just me being the sports nut, I remember back in the day, I, I Googled this before, 2014, Atletico Madrid versus Barcelona. At the time, Barcelona played a very similar style of football to what Manchester City played. A lot of passing on the ground. And one of the things they did, very sneaky, 
Atletico Madrid at the home ground let the grass grow long so the ball didn't roll so fast, so that they had a tactical advantage and they made Barcelona play in a different way than they normally would. I'm really interested. Have you ever had a coach? And maybe you can't answer this question. (laughs) (laughs) But have you ever had a coach come to you? And if you can't, that's okay. Uh, But have you ever had a coach come to you and say, I want this faster or I want this slower for this certain match. Uh, Matt Oliver told us that FIFA give him a range of 23 to 25 millimeters he has to cut in. And what are you looking at going to play or not going to make turf for Pep Guardiola, such a famous coach and such a famous uh, tactician who plays this way? Are you expecting conversations from him to be like, sit down, hey, mate, how are you going? This is how I like things. This is what I want. Uh, No Leicester logos. It's the Man City logo in there, (laughs) you know. So do have you ever had somebody ask you, are you expecting people to ask you like that? And do you have the same sort of restrictions in the Premier League that FIFA put on these sorts of things now? Yeah, so it has become more standardised because people were doing that. You know, I think there's there's famously, I think Stoke City used to they could make their pitch bigger, longer, and shorter. And there was a story in the in the press, I think, where they kept the wings long and the middles short to try and slow Arsenal down or something. But um, typically, everything we do, as I said, is consistent. We absolutely speak to the manager about what his style of football is, um, and we work to that style of football. So, for example, when Brendan was here. He played a fast pace on the ground. So his his sort of remit to me was we like it short and wet. Now, how short and wet that is depends on us. Um, but as long as he's getting the reaction from the ball, that's all he was concerned about. And the ball could fizz across the surface well. My goodness, this has been a, a fascinating podcast. I'm really enjoying it. Quick interjection here, because as you know, this podcast is supported by the Lawn Shed. They are a provider of fantastic, high-quality uh, lawn care products. Last week we had a guest, Matt Oliver. He uses products from Living Turf, the parent business of the Lawn Shed, but the Lawn Shed is targeted to small businesses. So if you're a small business, get a trade account, say that you heard from us when you log in and you can get the same sort of access to the amazing products that are used at stadiums, believe it or not, in Australia. <laughs> Let's get back into the podcast. So we've just had a technical difficulty. We're back. We're just talking about Pep Guardiola. You've had you've had coaches come and tell you before, hey, we want this certain style, so we want you to cut the lawn in a certain way. And I think you were just about to say the different um, heights or the the restrictions that the um, is it the FA or the Premier League put on your um, yeah. you know how you maintain the lawn. Yeah. So again, I was just saying. Sorry before I got cut off. Is um... The Premier League now, again, as they did with the patterns, they standardise a lot of what we can do because there was a little bit of um, tomfoolery, shall we say, going on um, with some clubs doing what exactly what you said, keeping it long, keeping it short. Um, but we tend to we tend to work with the manager, work to his style of play, and you know we then two things can affect it. It's not always down to the height of cut because sometimes if you've got a really really thick pitch, the ball drags across that, so that the actual friction on the ball, there's there's too much sort of surface area in yes. contact with the ball. Um, so although you can sort of maybe cut a little bit longer, I wouldn't say too long, but you can cut a little bit longer if your pitch is thinner because the ball reacts in a very similar way. Um, as part of the, the studies that we're doing in the background with pitch testing, we're also doing this um, bit of research into ball speeds and watering um, because you'll see in Premier League games, in most soccer games, is that the water will come up at half time yeah. before the game. That's purely for ball response. Um, it's purely to allow the ball to move as quickly as possible across the surface. And listen, the the Premier League is is a brand of entertainment. And if if we're all slowing the game down, not allowing the ball to move, not allowing the play to move freely, yes, I see. Know, yeah, they, they sort of standardise things to make sure that there is a certain element of of football able to be played. So, yeah, that those days of the the shortening the pitch, length in the pitch, long short grass, it, it's it's getting cheeky. Gone. Yeah, and the managers they will they will stipulate based on the the style of play that they have. But typically, once they stipulate it, they don't change from it. So it's not like they will come to us the following season and say, "Actually, I want to slow the game down." So can we cut it a bit higher and not water it? So that doesn't really seem to exist anymore. I want to. Uh, one of the things as well that I'm really fascinated by is is what what's it like for you? Because it would be very stressful 
uh, I assume it's very stressful on, on match day and you're coming up. Maybe, um, you know, you've got some, some really hot heat and the, and the lawns. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because I'm assuming it's ryegrass. Is that correct? Do you yes, own yeah. so with anything else throughout the year? 100% ryegrass in this country, typically. Yeah, because we... We have cooch or Bermuda uh, yeah. in the hotter months and then over so with rye. But uh, if I can put these photos back up on the screen, because I've got one here, and you might know uh, about this as soon as I put it on the screen. It's not from Leicester, but um, let me add it there. This is from a Liverpool-Burnley match that I watched live, and I remembered this. If I look down here, yeah. you see these patches? There was a fungal disease. And I could not get my eyes on that the whole match. I was like, just something you, I don't think most people would have noticed it, right? Like, but I did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, we're weird like that. And I don't know if you were aware of that, but I can imagine the, the whoever the, the, the grounds manager is or the turf manager, whatever their title is, that would really be a stressful moment because that could that could get worse. I don't know if they've put green dye over that or if it's, that's just the start. I have no idea what disease that is, by the way, because I've got no yeah. idea about ryegrass because ryegrass can only survive for about four months here in, in Perth, Western Australia. Imagine, but yeah. uh, what's what's this disease? And have you ever had moments like that where you start seeing an outbreak or, or something like that happening? Yeah. Is it really stressful? And how do you handle that as a professional? And, and what's so I think I remember this one. So at, the, at that <laughs> point in time, I think this was through COVID because you can see the, the signage mm -hmm. inside. Um, I'm pretty certain it was Dave Roberts who was the grounds manager there. And obviously the industry that we're in, we all do talk to each other um, and, you know, ask for advice and help and all the rest of it. And from what I remember, and I may I, I may be corrected on this, but I feel like that was a nematode issue. So we oh. suffer, yeah, we suffer a lot with sort of root knot nematodes in this country, um, and that they have to be managed in a cultural way um, and also a biological way because uh, there's no registered nematicides in this country. Um, and obviously, what you can see there, from what I can understand, in effect, that the nematode sort of buries itself into the root and blocks the blocks the plant taking up any nutrient through the roots. That's why you get the discoloration because it's a lighter green because it's not getting the same nutrient as what's around it. Um, and you know it, that's they're sort of endoparasitic nematodes, and you also get an ectoparasitic nematode, which is basically, if you can imagine, it's like a unicorn. It's got a big spear on its head. <laughs> So instead of instead of burying itself into the root, which a root knot does, it basically spears into the root and then draws all the the goodness out of the roots. Um, so it's yes. um, I think I think that was nematodes from what I remember. But we've suffered this year at the King Power with something called bacterial wilt. Um, yeah, I've seen that. Never seen not it. on your not on your pitch. Sorry, I'm not, 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 I've seen that. No, have, I wouldn't have. No, um, but I'm not. I'm not. I've heard of that disease. I've heard of nematodes before. But yeah, yeah. bacteria. Sorry, back to you. Bacteria will. And yeah, we've um and um, we've suffered. We've never seen that before. We've seen little glimpses of of it in the past, but it's nothing to the scale of what we had it this year, where we really were. It's really evident. It actually looked like we had um sort of been dashing seed around and it was looked like new seed coming through really randomly um, in patches and then also in straight lines it was it's the oddest thing um but we think we've transferred it through you know walking across the pitch with the mowers and one thing and another um right. and we've used a bit of a, a what they call a biofungicide here it's, it seems to attack it and we've used a, a fair amount of phosphites as well to try and combat it and we're through the woods with it now it, the pitch looks a million times better from what it was it never really damaged the integrity of the pitch or the playability of the pitch. It just looked terrible. Um, but yeah, we're we're through that now. But I think maybe there's a combination of that and nematodes at Liverpool that year. But um, from the conversations I had with Dave at the time, I'm pretty certain it was nematodes. Um, and it's something that we all have to manage here. They're, they're more and more prevalent. Um, and as the temperatures warm up, they seem to enjoy that a lot more. Um, and, you know, it's um, it's just, we just have to keep on top of it and manage it. But it is the pressure because... Listen, whether we like it or not, we're on the world stage. We are been viewed by billions of people around the world. And only when something like that pops up or there's a, a patchy pitch is when people start taking notice of, of what we do and asking the questions. But yeah, I think it's um, it's a struggle. But I say we're fortunate here that we do confide in each other. We do ask for advice um, and that helps us all get through difficult situations. So that is quite helpful, but it's stressful nevertheless. 
it's a funny thing about uh, and, and I, I've I've had this with other stadium managers that I've talked to over the years that um, there is this. It's funny that there's this such camaraderie between the different teams in in terms of the managers. Sorry, the the, the turf managers, and the other the teams hate them. So like, like you know, your arch nemesis on the field. Is yeah. like you know you might call up you know you, you might have been you know fighting Liverpool for a Champions League spot at that stage or something like that <laughs> you know and they might have been you know, your nemesis or something they might have been one of the teams stopping you from winning that Premier League and yet you'll call the other guy and they'll help you out with the turf you know yeah so it unites so what do you do sorry what do you, what do you do with so I've heard now this could be completely wrong but I've heard that you've got some um, quite strict rules in the UK with um, what types of fungicides or things like that you can use more strict than what we've got over here. Is that right? Yeah. Well, the, 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 the sort of EU legislation that we have to sort of adhere to, even though we're not necessarily part of the EU at the minute um, is, is getting tighter. The, the limitation on what we can apply to our pitches is, is getting tighter. But what's that, what that is forcing us to do is look at a more sustainable biological way of managing these diseases through turf health rather than sort of, I always call the, the fungicides like the paracetamol on the shelf. You know, yep. you can, the sort of biostimulants that we use and, and the plant health that we look at is a bit like taking your vitamins every day. You know, you try and do your best to be as healthy as you can to avoid getting a cold or a cough, but you need the paracetamol in the cupboard just in case it, it creeps up on you and hits you. And, you know, we work very much that way. Um, introduction, uh, probably our best introduction or one of the best introductions we've had in, in recent times is the our UVC machine. Um, so our, it, it, we walk across it. Um, it's basically like, a, if you can imagine a sunbed underneath a, like a, an aeration machine, um, it floats over the surface. That's a very the... interesting picture. You wouldn't want to oh, lie. No, no. You want to lie under a sunbed. You really don't want to lie under an aeration machine. machine. Yeah. It's a sunbed. It's very confusing. Sun, sunbed on three <laughs> wheels. That's probably the best way to put it. Okay. But, um, but the, the UVC rays smash the pathogens in the early stage. Um, we've got, we monitor our pictures wow. 24 seven. Um, and we look at disease pressure through the weather. We look at sort of the anticipated spike in, in when we might have an outbreak of disease and we'll go out and treat with a UVC machine. It's non-intrusive. You wouldn't know you've been on it apart from the wheel marks. Um, and that's, it's a proactive management. Wow. To, to ne I've never heard of that. I've never yeah. heard of treating fungal disease with light, right? Yeah. Is that, you, and, so the, and you, does the turf, does the turf get a little bit wilted or hurt or is it just like nothing no, happened? It only affects the pathogens, uh, the early stages of the pathogen. So it's not, you wouldn't necessarily, once you, the disease is present, it's probably a bit too far gone. But in the early stages, those UVC rays will smash through the pathogens and stop them from sort of forming and, and turning into something that could be quite terrible. Um, it will never, we'll know we'll ever eradicate the requirement for fungicides. I don't think that will probably ever happen. It may do in the in the long distant future, but certainly not in the short term. Um, but what we need to do and what, what it's forced us to do, should I say, is be more thoughtful about how we apply chemicals, which is ultimately for the environment, the right thing to do. Um, so we we sort of have a, a limited shelf of, of fungicides that are available to us now in the UK. Um, so we do use the biostimulants. Phosphites are a really effective way. So I think phosphites in the US are actually a registered um, fungicide, um, but they're not the class as a biostimulant currently in the UK. Um, so we do use them in a lot of our sort of tank mix applications to ensure that we can keep the plant healthy and try and uh, right. as best we can keep the, the, the disease at bay along with the UVC machine. And then obviously we have got the paracetamol should we need it, um, but it's not our first. We don't reach for it rather, uh, you know, readily. We sort of try and avoid it if we mm. can. How much do these UVC machines cost? Um, I mean, they're not massive. I guess it depends on, it's all relevant, I guess. it's You know, I think they'd probably knock around about 30,000 euros for a new one. Um, so Gee. maybe what, $50,000? But if you look at our, um, you know, our, just to give you an example, to spray, if we sprayed our entire site at the new training ground, you're talking 15,000 pounds per spray um, in chemical, in just product, um, because of the cost and of... You, and then you might have to not be able to play on certain services for a certain period of time. Yeah, or... exactly. So, and... Listen, I think the difference is, is that we don't we don't really use a UVC machine at the training facility because we are so open. So the, the training ground is very open. There's lots of air movement. 
there's lots of good weather. There's not oh, an NYC climate. But within a stadium, as I'm sure Matt alluded to, you've got a microclimate that is completely different to what's going on outside. There's no air. It's twice as hot because you're surrounded by stands effectively growing grass in a greenhouse in summer and then in a shed in winter with no light. Um, so it has the st stadiums have their own challenges. And it, so there isn't sort of like a blanket treatment for stadium and training grounds. They do differ because of the environment they sit in. But yeah, we are very conscious of trying to be more sustainable in the way that we approach our sort of chemical program because the trains coming down the track eventually will be down to maybe one or two that we can use. And then we're really, if we haven't got a good way of proactively managing it and we're always reaching for that paracetamol, we, we could come and stuck and you could see pitches fall off the face of the earth. So we've got to be, we've got to be mindful and got to be forward thinking on it. And the, certainly the UVC is, and the monitoring systems we've got, you know, with the weather and the, the pitch monitoring system that we've got helps us sort of keep a track on what we're doing and proactively manage it. Have you ever had a massive so uh, you you've had you've talked about the fungal issues you've had or things like that have you ever had like physical damage to the pitch so um like before a game or at the training ground like has anybody i mean this is this is something that happens in bogan australia bogans are like the redneck australians right where uh you know they'll get their motorbike and drive all over the not like a stadium pitch or something like yeah. that but you know like your local you know football over or cricket pitch down the road um have you ever had somebody, you know, break in and and vandalize, or have you ever had uh, like a pitch invasion or something like that, where just the sheer number of people on the pitch just creates, you know, uh, damage to it? Yeah, I mean, we've never had, we've been fortunate that we've never been involved in any sort of malicious vandalism where someone's drove in. Um, we work with a lot of clubs in our local community to help them improve their pitches, and we've been out to a couple of cases that have had that. And it, it, it's tragic, really, because these guys put their heart and soul into producing pitches for, you know, little Johnny who plays on a Sunday for grassroots. And then some idiot decides it's OK to drive a quad bike and do donuts in the middle of the pitch that they've poured their heart and soul into. So we'll often be called out to things like that. And, and we do a lot of outreach work through the Sports Surf Academy within our local community to improve their pitches. So that's a really important part of what we do. So I've seen it there, um, but certainly I've never seen it um, at a football club. Um, but we, I, I've experienced pitch invasions. Um, I was at Coventry City, used to play at Highfield Road, um, when, again, that's where I grew up, at the back of that ground. And um, on the last day, we, we were the stadium was closing and we were opening a new stadium. And, and on the last game, we had a full-on pitch invasion. Um, and when everyone disappeared, there were, I think there were about 50 separate patches that had been dug out. Some people had brought forks and spoons oh. and spades and someone had took <clears throat> both penalty spots um someone had ripped the net to take a bit of the net with them um so and we still had a corporate events on after that last game so we had to go and patch all these areas up to but you know it's it, it sort of happens it's not right but that's about the, the the limit of what i've experienced in terms of damage that hasn't been from just football play footballers playing on it so well i'm very respectful of your time and uh we've gone over a little bit on what i said we would do Sorry. I've got one more question for you. Going forward, you're at, we talked about Man City and you've got a big change coming up. You said you look forward in the next five years. What would be success for John for the next stage of your career, moving to Manchester City? Are there goals there just to do with the stadium or to do with what's going on around the world with the different clubs they have? Yeah, I think I think there's a couple of things for me. Um, it's similar to what we've done here is, is that, you know, I believe that I'm, I'm a firm believer that people make good pitches. The, the pitches will not exist. The pitches won't be what they are without the good people that operate on them and look after them behind it. And I think what I'd like to do at Manchester City is, is build a culture within the grounds department that, you know, helps us build respect and trust across the club. Um, and therefore then across the group um, that we do things properly, that we're professional, not saying they're not now, but certainly to a bigger end, to sort of like an end goal in terms of what are we trying to achieve. Um, what I've managed to do along with the team here is put Leicester City's grounds team on the map. Um, and I want to hopefully match the success of Manchester City and the City Football Group. And I want the grounds team to be an integral part of that. Um, I want us to be thought of as a really important part of the jigsaw piece that is the the city football group um try and align some of the strategies across the world which would be great um but also sort of understanding 
different cultures across the world and how how we can manage turf in different cultures and with different restraints and that bit's exciting for me as well so i think success for me is always based on my people when i when i leave here um i hope i leave with people that are, are proud to work for me work with me and um and that will go on to do great things because they're my legacy when i see people that i've worked with in the past going on to bigger and better things i'm okay with that because i've been part of that with them and I think for me, the people measure your success and that will be the focus for me at Manchester City is to, I'm not a people pleaser, you know, I won't sort of be yes, 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 yes to everything, but I am a people person and people mean everything to me because they're the ones that produce the goods at the end of the day. Um, so it's important we look after them. So I think the culture, if we can create the culture, create the respect um, and get that sort of, you know, that cultural shift that I think that we need there. I think that will probably be one of my proudest achievements along with what obviously what we've achieved at Leicester. So, yeah, I'm excited for it. I'm looking forward to it and uh, I'm looking forward to see what the future brings. Well, that's a great way to finish. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, I'm, I, I can't guarantee I'll be a fan of Manchester City Football Club or the football <laughs> team, sorry, because there's no Australians in there yet, but I will be a fan of their turf. Every time <laughs> I'm going to watch them on TV, I'm going to be like... That's some good looking lawn right there. But thanks so much. And look, honestly, the I have about 45 million questions still on my list of things. The 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 depth of stuff that came out in just some things that I thought were gonna be basic questions. I mean, I've learned so much. I've I didn't know you could kill fungus fungal issues with light. But I didn't know just the 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 depths of what goes into trying to stop people from getting injured my goodness thank you so much for enlightening us and um all the best for your move thank you so much thanks Steve. thanks for me on